Well, after a short-term reprieve and loosening of financial conditions, we are back talking about inflation, inflation, inflation. Have the risk balls had their fun in the sun? Is their days numbered and the dollar due to strengthen? Blake and I discuss all these factors and more as we go into the trade-off. Well, hi there. My name's Chris Weston. I'm Head of Research here at Pepperstone. And I'm going to be joined in two seconds by Blake Morrow from Forex Analytics. And we're going to be discussing and navigating all the trends and all the thematics and the setups of this map world of trading. And I'm going to bring the great man back into the programme. Blake, it's been a week since I saw you last. Um, I want to discuss uh, an event that we've got next week because it's really going to be quite nice for you. You're going to have a couple of weeks off. I'm going to be in the UK uh, to, to, to co-host Pepperstone Talks, which is an event that we're putting on for clients to discuss uh, all the things that are going on in the financial world of markets. You know, we're talking about trading headlines. We've got some really big name speakers. I'm going to show you a list of them right here, right now. So you can just see those people who are just sitting over there. Um, and those people will be discussing everything that's going on from trading to strategy to, to markets as well. So you've got two weeks off. And for anyone who's watching the show, obviously give it a bit of a like. But do register for the event. It will be replacing for the show as well. So do come up. And if the time doesn't suit you, um, make sure that you, you, you register so you can actually get the recording. You can watch on demand as well. So, Blake, you've got a couple of weeks off, my good friend. Man, that's going to be a great event. Uh, if, if, if I could make it over there in time, I'd be there. So if you're in the area, if you're in the UK, you got to be able to go. you got to go see Chris in, in person. Well, if you can't watch it live, you can't stream it, just make sure that you, uh, you, you, you register so you can watch on demand at a more suitable time for you. Anyway, Blake, let's go, let's go into the program and uh, let's discuss everything that's going on. Let's go into Topical Thunder. Well, I want to start off with inflation this week, Blake, because it is, and it has been actually the, the talk of the town for most of the year, and I'm sure it probably will be for most of, of the year going forward. But I think we've seen a bit of a short-term reprieve in markets before I sort of go into stocks and everything that we've been seeing. There has been a, a slight loosening of financial conditions. I think we saw Raphael Bostic sort of giving it this kind of little pop pivot last Monday, and markets sort of went, well, we're a bit underloved, a bit oversold, and, and that was enough for just people to come back in. But now we're seeing inflationary trends really kick up. I and mean, we saw the Bank of Canada last night, they're clearly worried. They raised 50 basis points but said, you know, if inflation continues the way that it's going, they could raise 75, and that's something that the market is is bidding up the cat of the Canadian dollar. Um, you know, we've seen a number of Fed officials saying that they need to get rates up to 2.5% as quickly as they can, perhaps in going to 3 before they even think about a pause. Um, you know, we've seen European inflation numbers, you know, coming out at 8.1% multi-decade highs. Global inflation, if you aggregate everything out, is, is around 8%, which again is, is, is multi-decade highs. So central banks need to get in front of this. How are you seeing the inflation story and how concerned should we, should we be right now? Well, first of all, I do think it's front and center, at least. I mean, I know it is globally, but here in the United States, as we head into the midterm elections, it is really in the front front and center of every politician. Everybody's talking about it. And I had an interesting conversation with a gentleman today, and he brought back, you know, some statistics from the 70s. You, you know, when you look from like the early 70s all the way to the late 70s, you know, there was persistently high inflation for so long. And of course, you know, if you, you, you know, 50 years ago or 40 some odd years ago, you forget and all the market participants today really forget what happened back in the 70s. But it was persistent and it was long term. And I know, like you said, the central banks are trying to get in front of it. But the, the question is, are they going to be able to bring inflation, you know, down to, you know, two percent or I, I think those are very lofty goals and I just don't see it based on you know the 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 geopolitical situation that's happening right now you you've got reluctance of 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 uh of you know suppliers and refiners you know picking up you know uh production I, I just think it's going to be a long-term issue that we have to deal issue. with yeah I mean, yeah, I, I, I agree, mate. As a I, agree. Consumer. I think you've still yeah. got your flares from the 70s. I can I can imagine you still wear them. Um, but there are some, some encouraging yeah. signs. Container freight rates are coming down a little bit. Inventory levels at corporates are, are, are increasing. Um, there are some very modest early signs that some of the supply chain issues are coming down and easing a little bit there. 
we're obviously seeing high energy prices. That's part of the inflation issue. But wheat prices and food prices are starting to look vulnerable. We're going to look a little bit more of those in the moment. So there are some early signs that, that supply chains may be defreezing and declogging, which is going to be you know, you know, going to bring hopefully bring down the inflation rate. I sit in the camp that we've seen peak inflation, but it's not going to crack. It's going to be a slow, gradual grind, if anything, there as well. And I think and specifically, I central banks are not going to let this slip away. Now they still need to push the iron here. Yeah, and I and I and I don't disagree. And I think the topics that we talk about today are really going to be focused on the number one issue that you have. But let's turn our attention over to the stock market really yeah. quick, Chris. You know, the, the market, you know, I, I guess I got to ask, is the downside over for now? Last week, we were talking, uh, and, and really over the last couple of weeks, about sentiment being so in, just in the dumps and, and, and to a point where it was a little extreme. And stocks have really bounced back. We, we, we bounced back above 4,100 in the S&P, which is a big, I call it the, uh, the bull bear line, and we're, we're basically sitting on it at the time of recording. But we were you know, well above it going into the end of last week. And, and I guess the question is that I need to ask is, is, is the downside in, and are we going to see any more downside? And my answer to that, and I want to hear your views here, is that we still have further to go. Mm. But I just don't know if we're going to see downside first. I still think that the sentiment is pretty, pretty, pretty dovish yeah. uh, or pretty bearish mm. in, uh, overall. You got people targeting 3,500 still in the S&P. And I think we're going to eventually go there. But I think the whole market is there's, we're going to climb that wall of worry. And you know, it's annoying, Chris, you know, it's annoying when the market, it's, it's going to be one of those unloved rallies, but I do believe we have to sell into it. The 200 day moving average is just above 4,400. And I, I don't think we're going to quite make it there, but that's my view. I think we go a little higher mm. before we make another surge to the downside. What are your thoughts here? Yeah, I, I, I was asking you last week whether you think if we're going to get an, an un, unloved rally, and um, you know, I think that was that yeah. was the case. No, no one really, no one really wants to buy this market. Um, and and we got up to forty two hundred in the S and P futures, and and that's kind of rolled over a little bit. Look, I do see some downside risks here. To me, like there's no way that the Fed are going to allow financial conditions to ease. We saw high yield spreads coming in quite sharply. Yeah, the US dollar, which is so so pivotal to uh, financial conditions, yeah, that's that sold off about three and a half percent or so from those recent highs. Yeah, real rates came down to negative thirty basis points in fives. They pushed back up a little bit. There's no way that the Fed are going to go. Look, we've got an inflation problem, but we're going to allow it financial conditions to ease. They just they're just going to fight. They need to get in front of that credibility issue. So I think they're, they're going to stamp it back, stamp it out now, which suggests to me tactically that we're probably going to see a little bit more downside in, in the S&P. I, I, do we get down back into 4,000 4, in the S&P? Perhaps. Um, but I see that, that, that we're much more likely to get down to 4,000 than where we are to go to, say, 4,400 uh, in, in, in the S&P in the short term. So, so more this downside, you... but uh, whether we crack that 4,000 level is a big one there. Okay, so a question to you, Chris. Do we see 3,800 first or 4,300 first? There, you know, I mean, we're kind of in the middle between the two. Probably downside, mate, to be honest. Um, I know there's, okay. a, there's a lot of people looking to buy the market. The downside, the, the buying pressure that we've been seeing has been good. I don't see I don't see it getting overly ugly. I thought that was going to be the case a couple of weeks ago where I thought well, if we make another leg lower, it could get really, really ugly. But I'm not so sure that's going to be happen. But what's one thing, I, I do see the downside as the more likely path. The one thing that we always need to, need to say is, is what I think and, and what actually transcends the two very th separate things, just have an open mind. And if the market goes yeah. down, just be prepared to, to trade that tape in that way. So always have an open mind. The market will tell you what it's going to do. The market does what it wants to do on any given day. Just react. Anyway, look, we're talking about ACB policy here. Why don't we talk about what we're having at Bank of Canada? We can talk about the RBA. We can talk about the Fed. Um, we just did talk about the Fed. But one of the big ones that we're talking to clients about at the moment, and I'm sure you guys are talking to, clients, to, to traders at uh, Forex Analytics, is what's happening in ECB policy. Has it gone too far? And we've seen so many different ECB speakers uh, coming out over the last last week or two, really. You know, are we going to see a 25 basis point hike in July? We've seen four ECB members, including or really driven by Mr. Holzman, uh, talking about a 50 basis point hike there. The market's pricing at about 37 basis points of hikes for that 21st of July meeting, which means they're kind of do we get 25? Do we get 50? Are we going to the September meeting? Are we going to get 25? Are we going to get 50? The bottom line is, is that, that Europe has a, a, an inflation problem. They've got a growth problem as well. 
Um, and they've got to try and balance this. Which for me, why the ECB is probably the, the most interesting central bank out there at the moment. They've, yeah, they could, if we're going to see a recession, they probably could even be in recession fairly soon. Certainly France is looking quite precarious. But they've got a massive inflation issue and they're going to have to balance that out using rates. I mean, what happens here, Blake? I mean, it's just such a fascinating story. Well, I think that if there's a central bank that has the ability right now to talk but act differently, yeah. meaning they're going to use their rhetoric more so than the Fed at this point. Yeah. I think it's the ECB. Yeah. You know, they can they can actually they can talk a lot, but it's going to be watching their actions. I mean, we have we have the next ECB me meeting on the ninth, and uh, I mean that's next week. They, they you know, so they couldn't. Are you calling it? Do you think the door's yeah. slightly open? The market's giving it. Three, I think it three, is. I think three it basis is. Points of hikes is what the market's pricing, and they're saying nah. Open the door for a July high. We already know that three basis points. Could they surprise Blake? Could they do it? I, I, I don't know. But here's the thing is they're going to talk tough and then we have to watch their action. So I think it's going to be really interesting. And you're right. They are walking a tightrope right now, more so than any other economy. They are yeah. dealing, if you're in the Eurozone, you're dealing with, uh, you know, a slowdown in so many different parts of the, the 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 eurozone and then you've got summer tourist season right now and so many other parts of the eurozone and that's right then you got inflationary pressures ga gas prices look at that gas Mate, by the way ask, great call last you, week let me ask you a question right so okay first yeah. of all they're not going to raise right the reason why no one expects this is because they're still buying bonds at the moment right so they want to get rid of their yeah. asset purchase program that's going to end got to get rid of pep yeah and once that finishes then they, then that opens the door for raising rates in july which is why no one's expecting rate hikes at this coming meeting but quickly we've got i think we've got 17 seconds left these guys are buying bonds and they've still got negative 50 basis point deposit rates or 40 basis point deposit rates and they've got 8.1 percent inflation how on earth does that reconcile itself I don't know. I don't know. You put yourself in a box. It's crazy, right? It's crazy. It is. It is. It's a. It's a crazy world, and it's going to get crazy over the next next couple of ECB meetings. So, hey, I, I want to talk. You know, you talk about inflation. Let's let's talk about gasoline really quick, and yeah. uh, and talk about. Uh, you, yeah. You, and by the way, I threw the uh, the producers off. R B O B O M G. So you know. Oh my God. And do, do you know what R? Do you know what R Bob stands um, for? Uh, I, I got a question. You don't? Uh, no, I should. Everyone's going to think I don't know what I'm talking about. No, go on. I didn't, I didn't either. <laughs> Reformulated blend stock for oxygenate blending. All right, mate. Thanks. That's great. Yeah, so just in case you wanted to know. Yeah. Anyway, every, everybody's fo focused on gas prices. I mean, it's in the news here. We have, like the, we, we have reports of you know, uh, unleaded gasoline hitting $8 in certain parts of Southern California, which is always you know, very, very high anyway, but you know, where I live, it's, it's quite high. You, you talked about it a few weeks ago, filling up your, your SUV, your family vehicle cost you 150 Aussie dollars. I mean, here in the U S it's costing me a hundred dollars to fill up my cars mm -hmm. and my trucks. And it's like, you know, it's on everybody's mind and there's nothing that there's nothing that, that anybody can really do about it. And, and everybody looks at the administrations, whether in the U S or other governments and like, what are you going to do? Um, Actually, I think that just just there was a headline just a little while ago that Saudi Arabia will will you know pump more you know they'll they'll go they'll pump more if uh, if if uh, Russia doesn't meet certain output goals or whatever it is, yeah. and that that's going to ease a little bit of pain. But what do you think, Chris? I mean, you know, are we getting to a point where uh, you know you're going to see carpooling around uh, Melbourne? I mean, is that is that going to be a thing? <laughs> oh, no, I don't think so. To be honest, I mean, we talk about savings rates and they've come down, yeah. but uh, it's still. Yeah, you're talking about a year-on-year -year change there. The aggregate level of savings is still very, very high indeed. And that should sort of absorb some of these costs that we're seeing um, yeah, for everyday everyday use. But, yeah, I mean, I think with, with Nat Gas, for example, and um, and our Bob and everything, they're sort of just chopping around. Crude's had a bit of a move last week and then and, and this week, and, and it's come back and it's sort of consolidating at these highs. Um, yeah, I, I don't see a collapse anytime soon. If you look at the, the energy complex, if you look at the futures curve, it's just so backwardated. It's basically incentivizing people to be long. Just go and buy long, and you just hold the contracts, and then you know, wait, wait for the roll into the next into the next contract, and you're getting paid um, to to be in that position. You look at the inventory levels, and we've got such low inventory levels for this time of year, specifically in the US, where, where everyone gets in their cars and goes for a little drive. 
Um, but when you look at inventory levels at super low levels, even for this time of year, you look at the curve, it, it's hard to see a collapse anytime soon. I mean, I think everyone would love to see a collapse, and then including your mate yeah. Biden. But um, yeah, it's given all those those dynamics that we're seeing. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's a tough one to 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 I, I, this one lower. Yeah, and I was gonna. I'm not calling it lower, and and I think refineries have been very slow to come back online, and and it is going to continue to be a, a supply demand issue with with yeah. strong demand. I think moving forward. Yeah, so. I think that's right, mate. But you know, our Bob yeah. Gasoline now. You know, every day is a school day with Blake Morrow in the house. So that's an interesting <laughs> one as well. Anyway, let's go to that's a setup. Let's have a look at the charts, the front and center. But this is where it gets a bit interesting, Mr. Morrow, because yes. yes, it does. I'm starting to turn a little bit bullish on the dollar. Now, I could be wrong, and I'm happy to research and change that call. But overnight, as, as I said, I think the Fed now have said, all right, you've had your fun. You've let inflation um, in, in financial conditions ease. We can't let our credibility slip away here. And that means a slightly stronger dollar. Strong, the US dollar is, is central to everything that's going on. We've seen real rates moving back up again. I think real rates go higher from here. They've made a, they've broken out of a, of a flag uh, formation. Going to have a look at tips on, on trading. You can see them. That's going to be good for the US dollar. Now, how do you trade this? Obviously, the dollar index that we show here is 57, 58% weighted towards euro. Um, so we've got to take on euro, take on euro dollar, which we are going to talk about in a second. But we've broken through this this pattern here. You can see that it it, it argues for perhaps a move back into the twenty day moving average. You can see that divergence between the Bollinger Bands, uh, where you know on the number one we saw it break out below the low. Uh, it didn't quite um, on the on the lower low that we didn't see a breakout for the below the Bolling, lower Bollinger Band on the second time around. We see the divergence there, and it's creeped through that that downtrend that we've been seeing. So for me. This goes into the 20 day into 103, perhaps as high as 105 there over a longer term period. It's going to be driven by real rates, though. So we're watching that very closely. So the Fed is in control. Blake, tell me I'm wrong. I, you are wrong. Look, Chris, I'm telling you, you got you to be selling dollars right now. No, okay. I, I'm really actually I'm, I'm more. Well, we're going to get into my chart here in a second. But the dollar, I think, has 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 actually taken a nice little spill today. It rallied, and I I think it was more positioning than anything, especially following the ISM data. Yep. I don't think the ISM data should have pushed the dollar as as high as it did today. However, it did, and I think that was more poor positioning. People were getting pretty long euro. They think about the euro has gone from one hundred three and a half to one hundred eight, basically, in you know two weeks. So, mm. so right now, I think the dollar is is recovering here. But I think you need to sell rallies. But that is my view yeah. because well, of dollar yen's how obviously it been really failed. well traded above one thirty. I mean, dollar Swiss looks interesting at the moment. But uh, yeah, I mean everything like this. It's euro dollar, euro dollar, right? It is, and that's why I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to the euro, and I want to take actually the other side of that trade, mm. Chris, and and the euro. Right, what we're seeing here is we're seeing the euro reject the 108 level. It's pulled back. We're at the 38 percent retracement at the 106 level, and if you don't if you don't re recall how big 10630 is, just go look at the spike low post COVID lockdowns mm. that came in at 10630. This is a huge pivotal level for the euro. I was expecting it to come down to this level to start buying. And now that we're at the 38% retracement, I think it is going to, it's going to take that next stab higher. It's kind of like a, uh, you know, a battering ram hitting a castle, castle uh, uh, a gate. You know, it doesn't, it's not going to hit it. It's not going to break it on the first time. Hit that 108. We got to pull back to the 38% retracement. We're going to surge and make a, make a move above that 108. And I think the ECB, is going to be the catalyst next week, Chris. That's my call. But I, I have to go back to our, our previous guest that was here last week, Oscar Salem. He was long. He was uh, bullish the euro. I think he's on the right side here, and I want to. I'm going to join that trade. Yeah, I mean, I think it just this. I'm not necessarily bearish on this position. I'm, I'm open minded, but um, no, I think if we get a break through that 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 green line, that horizontal green line, that I think is, is the fourth of uh, fourth of May high as well. Um, yeah. Then, then I think we can take a, a, a sort of more progressive view that the euro dollar is going lower. Um, but look, I mean, look what's priced into fundamentally what's priced into into the euro uh, short term interest rate curves now. Um, I know, we, as I say, nothing really priced for for June. We don't expect that because they're still buying assets. They need to get rid of that. But 37 basis points for the July meeting. 
I think that's too hot. I think we're going to get 25 basis points. So from a rates perspective for the July meeting and for the 36 basis points that's priced in September, I think that's too much. So from a, from a fundamental rates perspective, I think there's been too much price short term. That's going to come out as we go through. And I think you know that, that potentially takes us a little bit lower, which is why we got that dollar. Plus, if we do see the equity market roll over, I think euro dollar goes down because you want to be long dollars rather than long euros in, a, in an equity drawdown and a, and a volatility spike higher. Anyway... One and that's what watch. makes the market. It's one to watch, <laughs> and uh, I will be right. Anyway, uh, we'll talk. We'll circle back in, in three weeks' time. Anyway, um, anyway, I want to bring this to the wheat chart. Um, wheat's a bit a bit exotic, I guess. Um, but you know it what is. we've been seeing is is Turkey playing intermediary between Russia and the Ukraine. And it looks like the signs are that, that Russia are allowing the Ukraine to get some of their wheat out to the masses into, through the Black Sea as well, through Turkey. Um, and the market has, 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 has taken that as some signs that yeah, both obviously Russia and, and the Ukraine are some of the biggest wheat producers and exporters in the world. So we've seen you know, wheat coming off about 20% from those recent highs. We're you know, testing those, those April, May lows at the moment, that swing position that you can see there. Um, obviously, I think anyone who's short would obviously love to see a break of that level on a closing basis. We're down 20%. So we've got that technical bear market. It means nothing to me. But for the human race, we want to see a lower wheat price. We, you know, a couple of months ago, we were talking about a food crisis. Wheat is central to that situation. Going to Egypt in, in, in a week or so's time, we've got a food tender coming through where they come out and, and they look to go and buy a ton of wheat. I mean, last I think we saw, we saw was in April, they bought 350,000 tonnes of the stuff from Ukraine, from France and other places. So that's something we've been watching. But a break of that, that level, we could get a, a really nice bear trend. It's going to be very positive for humanity all around. What do you think? Well, I think, uh, first of all, I'm not a big wheat trader. Uh, I love, I can just talk basically technicals here. Yeah, sure. And I love the, the fact that we broke, we, we like tested that upper Bollinger band and then we came back down, we've made lower highs. And I think that support right on is very key. If that support gives the 200 day moving average comes in around, let me take a look about 875 from where we're currently at. Yeah. And that seems pretty logical to me if we get a downside move in wheat and uh and i i'm i'm with you chris i'm long the human race man i i, I happen to i happen to love humans i love well, female humans we've got it more than anything <laughs> okay well thank you for that i'm sure i'm sure your wife knows <laughs> needs to know that as so. well anyway we've got a we've got an oversold condition we've got a market testing now it could bounce that, that's one for the scalpers there to look at um, but I, you know, obviously, I want this to, to go down. If we get lower oil prices, we get lower nat gas prices. Our Bob and uh, whatever the equation is that you said, um, and we were to get food <laughs> prices trading lower as well, that could mean that we're going to get lower inflation. So stick this one on your radar for sure. All right. Well, let's uh, let's turn it over to the yen, and uh, and I'm going to pull up the six J. And uh, you know, I tell you what, Chris, this is a bear flag pattern. And, um, and I love the 6J. I love the yen futures. And I know we were talking about this beforehand. Who trades yen futures? Like, what, are you a CTI or are you a trend follower or something like that? <laughs> Man, I love trading <laughs> yen pockets. futures. If you, you know, here you know, in the United States, sometimes we are, uh, we are limited to what we can trade. And, and uh, we, we tend to trade yen futures. I trade yen futures quite actively, actually. But look at that breakdown. And you can really see it in the dollar yen. You can see it. Look, take a look at the CAD yen. The CAD yen's pushing 103, pushing up against some really key resistance. Mm -hmm. Aussie yen, Kiwi yen, they all look really constructive to the upside. Euro yen, hell, that looks like it's going to trade past new trend highs. And now if this flag pattern plays out, we're looking at, you know, the dollar yen probably trading up towards 135 maybe. Yeah. And I, and, and, and again, whether you're playing dollar yen, you're playing CAD yen or any other yen cross, I just think that the yen looks extremely weak here yeah. and it looks like it is going to continue to break lower. So what do you think? Well, fundamentally, mate, we are back out of this period of volatility. We're back just short term. It feels to me that we're back talking central bank divergence. You know, we're talking about, you know, the Fed being aggressive, the Bank of Canada being aggressive. We're talking about the EC being aggressive. We've spent half a show talking about that. Um, and of course, the, the, the Bank of Japan is still like a million miles away. So I think right now we're talking about central bank divergence again. It sort of comes and goes, but we're back there at the moment. That means taking a negative view on the yen. You can see the price action is telling us that. So this is a basket of currencies traded against the yen. This is the yen against everything else. I, yeah, I think that's right. Have a look at um, <clears throat> have a look at Kajen. You don't have it here, yeah. but the CADGEN, everyone go and pull up a daily chart of CADGEN. It's in beast mode at the moment because you've got the CADs, the, the Bank of Canada being uber bullish, uber hawkish. 
And, uh, you know, obviously the Bank of Japan, the other side. So, yeah, I, I, I like Kajian. I think Kajian looks good at the moment. I think that, yeah, by pullbacks, it's going higher, in my opinion. Yeah, so an interesting there one, which takes us into a really nice episode of the show called Play of the Day, and where we're going to actually focus on a couple of those factors. Well, first one I want to bring up, uh, I actually went Nat Gas last week. It's down a little bit, a little bit in the money, but nothing too spectacular. I was hoping for a little bit more. This week I'm looking at Sterling CAD, and if we're looking at the equality move, uh, which is something that, that you pulled out in, 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 your, in your yen futures positions there, uh, we are sitting on, on very uh, key horizontal support levels there as well. Um, I want to see a break of this, these low levels where I'm kind of 157, 80, that kind of those lows um, that we're seeing. If we get that close, uh, this is going down to 155 and a half, in my opinion. Um, yeah, you can see we've had like four or five days of, of negative flow coming through. It's come off that top end of the range. Um, I want to see a break of that. That would give me real confirmation this is about to start bear trending. There's nothing really that I like in the pound at the moment. You know, real rates have moved up a little bit, but there's fiscal issues coming through. We've got Northern Ireland potentially making the headlines again. You know, there's a lot being priced in. Um, but again, you're, you're marrying this up against the central bank in Canada, uh, which has arguably become, along probably with the RBNZ, probably the most hawkish central bank out there. So I want to see this cracking through this, through that floor that we see. When it does... This is going downtown. It's getting downtown to 155 and a half, and I'm playing that from the short side. All right. Downtown Julie Brown, as they used to say on MTV way back in the day. Let's uh let's take a look at crude oil. Uh, and some of you might actually have gotten that one. Uh crude oil, and if you did, that means you've been around way too long. Uh crude oil has rejected the 120 level, and it's being rude. And I said it's rude crude because I'm actually looking to play it on the long side, but for you near term, you know, short side traders, you can probably play it to the short side right now. It's actually coming off already in Asian trade as we speak. Like I said, there were some headlines regarding uh, regarding Saudi Arabia and what they might do as far as production goes. But I think that crude towards the 50 day moving average takes us around the 107, 106 level. By the time we get there, that's going to be channel support. That's where I'd really want to be on the long side. But if you're feeling a little if you're feeling a little feisty and you want to like maybe trade a little counter trend, you might be able to you know skate a little short, you know, on the way down to 107. But I think 107 is the place where you want to play it, and it is in an ascending channel. Yeah. So that means you don't chase highs, you buy dips and you sell rips, and that's uh, we're we're up the near the trend highs, and I think you just buy it, dip back down to 107, Chris. And that's how I want to play. Uh, interesting. We've got the OPEC meeting coming up. Uh, I don't think anything's expected. So from that perspective, you may see some movement, just the fact that they're, they're not going to do anything. But uh, yeah, I mean, if, we if we're taking that view on wheat, let's be humans here, not just always traders. Um, it'd be great to see lower crude prices. It'd be great to see lower wheat prices. All of these factors would play into a lower cost of living for uh, for everyday souls out there. So, you know, from that perspective, it'd be great. And obviously that shows that I don't have a position on any, in either of those two contracts at the moment. Anyway, um, as I said, we've got a two-week break um, for Pepperstone Talk. So make sure you look at the link, register, watch it live. Or if you can't watch it live because the timing doesn't suit, watch it on demand when you can. We've got some great speakers. We want you to be there. We expect you to be there. Anyway, we're going to give Blake a nice two-week holiday, and we'll see you more for some for more of the same in a couple of weeks. See you on the trade-off. <laughs>